I went to church the other night, and I felt somewhat at ease. I thought I was a pretty good guy, and my Lord, I'd tried to please. But when the preacher took the floor, my pride all must have fled. After silent prayer, he took his text, and this is what he said. In Revelation 21, 8, we find these words, But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. My subject for this time is not very pleasant. It's called this hell-bound train. I'm not here to argue with you about religion, nor fuss with you about your belief. I'm here to tell you about this hell-bound train. Now, the engineer to this train is the devil. The conductor is one of his religious imps, and the passengers are those that follow Satan. I can see this train of deception pulling into the Garden of Eden. The conductor steps from the caboose and says to Eve, Yea, hath God said. In other words, God said not to ride this train, but really that's not what he meant, because he's a good God. He's too good to let you be destroyed. Eve saw that the train was beautiful, and she desired to take a ride. So she yielded to the voice of Satan, and as a result, Adam and Eve were the first among the fearful and unbelieving to ride this train of death and destruction. I can see this train coming through the Andalusian world, then on to Sodom and Gomorrah, going on to another stop in Egypt, where Moses stands before Pharaoh, and I hear him say to the king, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Old Pharaoh rares back and said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice. So atheism forced its way on this deathly train of disaster. This pale monster comes rolling through Babylon to take old Belshazzar and his intoxicated nightclubbers for their last ride. And now we go to Caesarea. Here I can see a well-dressed man with a beautiful woman. Who is that distinguished-looking guy? Oh, that's Governor Felix with his third living wife, Drusilla, the one he persuaded to leave her own husband to come and live with him. In front of the two is a prisoner, and yet he doesn't sound like one, for he speaks with a tear in his voice and as one having authority. I hear him say to the governor, Felix, don't live this way. There's a judgment day coming. Don't ride this train. The trembling governor, not willing to break with sin, wiped a tear from his eye and said, See you later, Paul. But Felix rode the train up no return. This hell-bound train comes to the station of the abominable. Here I can see Lot's wife, the proud, disobedient wife of a righteous man, and old wicked Jezebel, the painted viper of Israel. Then on to the place of murderers. Here I can see Cain, who slew his brother, Herod, who beheaded John the Baptist. There's old Nero, Mussolini, and Hitler, the killer of millions. All of these become riders on this pale monster of destruction. And now we come to the station of whoremongers. My, what a crowd here. Movie and recording stars, radio and TV stars, sailors, soldiers, and marines for the scores, businessmen, factory workers, truck drivers, salesmen of all kinds, so-called gospel singers. Well, what do you know? There's a member of one of the famous quartets of our nation. There's a preacher trying to hide himself. Just look at all those high school teenagers. Hell will surely have to be enlarged to make room for all this crowd. This hell-bound monster moves on to the place of sources and idolaters, the devil's religious station. Here I can see the witch of Endor, Simon of Samaria, religious people of all kinds, church leaders, pastors, well-known evangelists who had great revivals pulling fire down from heaven, casting out devils by the Lord's name. The Bible describes them as false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So we can see that the devil himself is a religious leader. His train may go with this name. Train of religion. Go with the crowd. The majority is bound to be right. So the deceived passengers fall to his philosophy. Listen, brother, the majority is going in the wrong direction. They're riding this hell-bound train. Look at all those idolaters on this train. The Israelites with the golden calf. Those who bowed to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Look at all those people worshiping their cars, homes, and televisions. They're serving the gods of brass, iron, wood, and stone. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They're riding this train into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This train pulls into the last stop, the station of all liars. Look at the people getting on at this place. There goes King Saul who lied to the prophet, Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the apostle, and 
and I can see church members with broken vows to God and the church, husbands and wives who lie to their companions, lawyers who lied in court, and car dealers and customers who lied in trade. Look at all those who lied about their income tax. All these become miserable passengers on this train to perdition, and they shall go away into everlasting punishment, to a lake which burns with fire and brimstone, for the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. I say to all of you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because great is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. And As a traveling minister, it's been my privilege to work with more than 20 different denominations and a number of independent religious groups. In my vocation, I've met some fine people. Then I've met some that were not so fine. I've met bootleggers, gamblers, drunkards, thieves, robbers, and desperate criminals. But the most distasteful people that I ever met were these evil-minded, trouble-making gossip reporters. Do you know who they are? They're the ones who tell all the bad things they know about people and half the things they don't know. They'd rather walk a mile to tell a lie than to stand still and tell the truth. They don't necessarily start the lie, but they rejoice in giving it a ride. Speaking of lies, they say a lie travels mighty fast. It will go about two miles down the road before truth ever gets its boots on. Do you know why a lie travels so fast? It has so many friends. Some people ought to put a sign over their ears. No dumping here. Someone said, I never listen to this gossip. I just let it go in at one ear and out at the other. Well, if you do, you do better than most people because most people let it go in at both ears and out at the mouth. Brother Bob became a victim of this gossip, and here's how it all happened. Sister Suspicion went over to see Mrs. Critic the other day, and she said, Brother Bob has really been flirting with the women here lately. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's not been stepping out on his wife. As soon as their vain conversation was over, Mrs. Critic rushed over to see Sister Exaggerator. And during the course of their gossip, Mrs. Critic said, By the way, did you know that some people think that Brother Bob's been stepping out on his wife? You don't mean to say, replied Sister Exaggerator. That's what they tell me, said Mrs. Critic. Now, by the time Sister Exaggerator put the finishing touch on this scandal, Brother Bob had been stepping out on his wife. And Bob soon discovered that he had been doing things that he didn't do. In case a lie should ever get started on you, don't ever try to stop it. Just let it go. It'll hang itself. Uncle Bud said he had seen cows licking their tongues through the crack of the fence, but he had seen some people that could beat that. He said they could lick their neighbor across the other end of town. Now, if any man among you seem to be religious, of course, that includes the women too, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. There's a difference between the women and the men talking. You can eavesdrop a half a dozen men, and one man will usually lead the conversation. You eavesdrop a half a dozen women, and you don't know who's leading the conversation. Perhaps both men and women talk too much. It usually ends with this gossip. Should you ever get tangled up with this gossip and start pointing your finger at the faults of others, you just remember three fingers are pointing back at you. And remember, too, it's better to speak a good word about a bad man than it is to speak a bad word about a good man. This gossip always carries the weight of criticism. They tell me that life is funny. Man comes into this world without his consent. He leaves it against his will. During his stay on the earth, his time is spent in one round of contraries and misunderstandings. If he raises a family, he's a chump. If he doesn't, he's too selfish. If he raises a check, he's a crook. If he's rich, he's smart but dishonest. If he's poor, he's a bad manager and has no sense. If he's in politics, he's a grafter. If he's not, he's an undesirable citizen. If he goes to church, he's an old hypocrite. If he doesn't, he's an old sinner. If he gives for charity, it's for show. If he doesn't, he's an old tightwad. When he first comes into the world, everyone wants to kiss him. But before he leaves the world, everyone wants to kick him. If he dies young, there was a great future before him. If he lives to be a ripe old age, 
is in the way. This would be a wonderful world and a much better place to live if it were not for this gossip.